How many of you are familiar with pharmaceuticals? Know a lot about them, very interested in them? Excellent. So $150 billion per year spent in just biomedical pharmaceuticals alone. And today's first speaker has spent 30 years in pharmaceuticals, but the last 10 have been specifically focused on innovation. So how do we develop drugs better and faster and spend less money doing so? Now, he's trained in science and business and has been doing this work for a very long time and has done some remarkable work in terms of drug development. And he's here to share some of that information with us today on how we can use, drug, how we can use big data to develop drugs better. He's currently a senior fellow with Faster Cures. I'm very excited to welcome him to the stage to talk more with us about his work. So I ask that you give a very warm welcome and round of applause to Mr. Bernard Munoz. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. A good friend of mine, Professor Brahmachari from India, the former chief scientist of India, likes to say that if you want to change the world, leave it to the kids. They know how to do it. They know how to do it because they've done it already. Look at the last 15, 20 years. Music, shopping, entertainment, commerce. Who's changing the world? It's Facebook, it's eBay, it's Amazon, it's Google, and a host of others. So I'm, up, I'm here today to tell you about another industry that badly needs that sort of uh, energy, that sort of drive. And it is the life sciences, which comprises pharmaceuticals, healthcare in general, and agriculture. Enormous amount of money, enormous amount of money are being spent on biomedical research. What do we get for that? In the case of drugs, 30 to 45 new drugs per year. We spend 150 billion. You can do the math. However you do it, it's a lousy return. We need to change that. You need to change that. Oops. So this is um, the quick overview of my presentation. Life sciences are prime for change, for transformation, because data drives innovation. And I will explain in a minute what this means. Data has already been the bottleneck, as well as the lifeblood of biomedical innovation. The reason why we're seeing so little innovation for what we spent is that the quality and the quantity of the data that we're collecting has been lousy. But that's about to change, and we'll talk about it. And the change has been driven by advances in mobile health technologies that are easing that bottlenecks with far-reaching consequences for business and for society at large. More excitingly, all that we need in order to affect that change has already been invented. We don't need to invent anything else. We just need to use it. Makes it a lot easier. And in order to do that, we need brains and we need leaders that can lead the transformation. So we need students, you guys. So data drives innovation. This uh, scientist, John Quackenbush at Harvard, once pointed out that if you think about the scientific revolution that have occurred in history, they've all been driven by one thing, and it is the availability of data. From Copernicus to quantum mechanics, it is data that drives innovation. Now, this is very powerful, because it implies uh, you want more innovation, get more data. Now, in the case of biomedical innovation, getting more data has been challenging, has been difficult. I mean, take the example of pharmaceutical and clinical research, which has been the main vehicle to collect data, patient data, over the last century. Well, perhaps not a century, but certainly since World War II. So you put together cohorts of patients in clinical trial, a few hundred to a few thousand, and every month or so, they being go, go to the hospital and they're being, 
you know, checked out. And I mean, such trial costs you tens of millions of dollars. And typically, what you, add, what you get out of the data uh, at the end of the trial is basically you know, a bunch of data collected on a periodic basis, typically monthly. Um, but it tells you really very little about what happens to those patients. It tells you something, but not enough. It doesn't tell you what happens between the visits inside the patient. So this kind of a fuzzy picture of biology uh, has somehow hindered our ability to understand what's going on. Now, this is changing because, uh, well, let me make a few, a, 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 a few more points there. Can do science without data, of course. And the, uh, yeah, the, the data that is collected by clinical trial is not only sparse, but is also often inadequate. Um, you have six or 7,000 diseases that have been recorded. Most of those are rare diseases. And we just don't have the data on those diseases to really understand what's going on. We don't have baseline data. If you don't have baseline data, you can develop a therapy to measure the improvement that you know, your treatment gives to the patient because you don't have the baseline data. Uh, some diseases like Alzheimer take decades to develop. You cannot speed that in a clinical trial. So your ability to really measure how you can modify your disease is really hampered. Um, and, and lastly, the tool that we've got today do not give us the ability to measure what happens in the long term. So you have a patient that has a, you know, a neurogenerative disease, you give him a treatment, uh, and you hope that you know, he'll get better, but you don't really know. You don't have the data. And as it turns out, half to 60% of the patient in most therapies don't benefit from, from the treatment, uh, but we don't really uh, know it or understand why. So we need to change that. And the direction of that change was pointed out to me a few years ago by my own son. He's an engineer, mechanical engineer, and uh, about several years ago, he got his first job at Caterpillar. And I was talking to him a few weeks later and he pointed out to me that those, that heavy machinery, those excavators that you see alongside, along the side of the road, are actually riddled with sensors. Sensors that, mod that monitor the performance of every part in those machines. Where they are, when they are used, uh, under what condition, the stress that, be, that are being applied to those parts the wear and tear, so that when something breaks, the engineer can access that data, because all that data, by the way, is sent wirelessly to the cloud, where it accumulates for every part of machinery around the world. So if something breaks, the engineers can go to the specific data stream and understand what happened. Why did that part break? Not only for that particular machine, but they can access the same data stream for every other similar model around the world. And it helps them understand what's going on. It helps them design better parts. It helps them predict failure. It helps them figure out what part needs to be made and stocked and where so that they're available when they're needed. And I was listening to that and I thought, gee, this is great. Why can't we have that for medicine? We can have it for cars, for excavators, but not for people. It sounded a little insane. Well, that was 2012. Since then, things have started to change, and they are changing fast. How fast? Well, as fast as Formula One, Formula One cars go. Some of you may have heard of the McLaren technology, or McLaren company, the, the race cars. Now, what you may not know about race cars is that the McLaren company outfits its cars with hundreds of sensors. I'm from the US and I live in Indianapolis. 
the day after tomorrow, we've got that big race, annual race. And all those cars are now being outfitted with those sensors. In one such race, each car will generate over a billion data points of data. Over a billion. Now, you, I mean, you realize how big that is. It's not a million, it's not 10 or 100 or 500, it's a billion. In a few hours, in two or two and a half hours. So, GlaxoSmithKline, another British company, kind of got wind of that and thought, hmm, maybe we should work with those guys. Maybe we should harness their expertise so that we can do the same thing with patients. And that's what they did. So in um, December 2014, GlaxoSmithKline and a company in the US who uh, leads uh, in the um, um, software area uh, with cloud-based software for the execution of clinical trial, they um, got together and they planned a trial. They were trying to understand what those biosensors can do, and more importantly, can it generate data of a quality that will be accepted by the regulators, since clinical research is heavily regulated industry. So they put together a cohort of a couple of 100 diabetic patients, and they gave them activity trackers, like the Fitbit thing. And they followed them for a couple of months. In a couple of months, they generated 18 million data points. 18 million at basically zero cost. Now, some of you may be familiar with biomedical research. You know that collecting that many data in a traditional setting would cost you in the tens of millions of dollars. And it would take you, you know, six months, a year. This was all done in a few weeks at basically zero cost. That's a sort of improvement that we're talking about. When you're delivering that sort of improvement, you're going to transform things. You remember the words, that, the, the numbers that were announced early in the presentation. We spent every year about $150 billion, just public companies. That doesn't include government, that doesn't include National Institute of Health and so forth. Just public company, industry, spent $150 billion in biomedical research. About $100 billion of that is for clinical research. If you can slash 80, 90% from that number, you're going to affect big change. So, they collected all the data, those 80 million data points, and then they went to the government, to FDA in the US, and they said, look at that. What do you think? Is it good enough for you? And the FDA looked at that, and they were impressed by the quantity of the data. And then, after analyzing it, they came back and they said, it's good enough for us. It's FDA compliant, as they called it. And experimentally, they tried to see how much farther you can go using those biosensors. Now, if you really use them in every possible way that you can, how much data can you collect? And experimentally, in a follow-up trial, they were able to collect as much as one gigabyte of data per patient and per hour. In the summer of 2013, the same company, Medidata, whom I work with, by the way, convened a group of people who think about those things, and I was one of them, but you had you know, senior scientists from major institution in the US, and trying to understand where research was going. We felt that you know, all those technologies, or sensing technologies and all that, are going to have a big impact. But in 2013, it was a little fuzzy, and we were wondering, what is really going to happen? So we got together for a couple of days and tried to basically envision what was coming. And I must say, we did a pretty good job of identifying the direction, what was uh, you know, going to take place. Uh, everything that I'm talking about today 
we kind of saw it coming. However, we were wrong. <coughs> Sorry. We were wrong in our timing. We thought that all that might happen perhaps by 2025. Well, it happened by the end of the following year. So what looks like science fiction in 2013 actually happened by 2014. The first trial using biosensors um, was conducted, as I mentioned, in December 2014. Eight months later, in June 2015, 300 trials were underway where patients were monitored by biosensors. So, I mean, it is moving. Thank you. Appreciate it. It is moving at, at the speed that, that, frankly, no one had anticipated. And this is good news because it means that change is on its way and uh, it's happening so fast and it's so powerful that uh, uh, it, it is unlikely to be stopped. So, let's talk a little bit about um, how it all works out. So you heard me talk about biosensors, and you know about Fitbits, and you know about you know, the iWatch, and you know about those things. Um, what you perhaps do not realize is that today you have such devices to literally measure hundreds of physiological or biological parameters, hundreds. I was at a conference in, uh, at the University of Minnesota a few months ago, and I talked about this device that's approved by the US FDA. You can buy it on Amazon. It costs you $70. And it plugs into your, your smartphone. And it basically allows you to give yourself an electrocardiogram. Now, if you do an electrocardiogram in a hospital in the US, the average cost is $1,500 and the inconvenience and all that. You get that stuff for $70, and you can give yourself electrocardiograms every 10 minutes if you're so inclined. So I was talking about that, and at the end of the meeting, some guy walks to me and said, I gotta thank you. And I said, thank you for what? He said, you know, I've got a fibrillation. I didn't know this thing existed. So during the, your presentation, I actually checked it on Amazon, and I bought it. And uh, so he uses it now. His, his wife, incidentally, was a physician. And she herself was not even aware of this thing. So it happens very fast, and, uh, but it is changing the way we are monitoring our health, the way we're treating ourselves. So you've got hundreds of uh, uh, so-called um, biosensors in various devices that are in existence. And each one communicates with your smartphone, and a smartphone processes the data and trans to transmit it wirelessly to the cloud where it accumulates. And it accumulates at the same speed as I mentioned earlier. You're talking about potentially gigabytes of data per day that it can accumulate. You know, once they're on, I mean, it's going to monitor you for months, for years. So if something happens to you five years, ten years down the road, and you don't know how you know, did I catch that? How, when did my uh, uh, health start to deteriorate? Or even what is it that I have? Uh, you have all the data that can help physician understand what's happening to you. And they can go back in time and see when those various parameters started to get, you know, out of kilter. But you can do even better. I mean, some of you may have heard of Watson, you know, the IBM AI thing. I mean, you can imagine very easily, a Watson system that possesses all the biomedical knowledge ever generated on the face of the Earth. And you're streaming the data from those biosensors through a Watson system, and that system can pick up faint signals that otherwise would go unnoticed. You know, deterioration of the quality of sleep here, problem with blood pressure here, you know, transient, and they can make connection and suggest that, hey, there's trouble developing long before medicine would pick it up. See, the problem with medicine today is that it starts when people get sick. But you don't really know very often 
what happens before the sickness develops, especially for those slow diseases, you know, like the neuro neurogenitive diseases, for example. Uh, you don't have any idea. In the future, you will. But that's not enough, or that's not only um, the only stream of data that you're going to get. You, of course, know about the genome and know that what used to cost millions, billions, actually, when we started, but millions not that long ago, I mean, you can get it now. I saw a number yesterday for $600. You can get your uh, exome uh, sequenced. So it's being done routinely in hospital these days. Um, and that gives you, you know, an additional picture about, um, about yourself. Your microbiome can also be sequenced. Um, your all medical records, which historically uh, are scattered pretty much around the world if you're traveled and uh, you can usually never access, uh, uh, are in the process of being centralized. Uh, and increasingly, the control over that data actually comes under uh, the... Um, uh, the, 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 the patient, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But all your whole history about, you know, the medication that you've taken in the past, uh, and uh, uh, all that is becoming available and transmitted in the cloud, so that each one of us will soon have a personal digital cloud with all our healthcare data. And if you're a data scientist, you got to salivate at that. I mean, the information that you can extract from such information, from such uh, data, is absolutely amazing. I mean, look at genome, for example. I mean, one genome gives you quite a bit of information about an individual. If you go to a thousand genome, or a hundred thousand, or a million, you can extract a lot more information from that same data. And you know, a year ago, I was involved in some meeting in Washington, uh, and it looked like, I mean, people were starting to talk about million patient cohort of this or that, but it looked like kind of science fiction. And a few weeks ago, I was actually counting the initiatives that are underway, that are recruiting patients, and there's already half a dozen of them that I know of, and more that I don't know that are all you know, enrolling millions of patients, 100,000 patients, both in the US as well internationally. And pretty soon, all this will be connected, and it will provide a body of data that, I mean, frankly, was unthinkable just, just a few months ago. And it's going to be a goldmine for data scientists because you, know, you guys have the skills to extract information from that uh, uh, cloud that uh, will give us some parallel insight in uh, disease and pathology. But that's not all. We also have what I call the smartification of objects. You heard about smart clothes. Well, you now have smart everything. Thermostat in your house that monitor you know, your environmental condition, the toxins. You have smart clothes. You have smart seats, smart toilets. You know, everything that you touch will soon be able to capture some biomedical data. And sometimes you don't even need to touch it. You just need to approach it, and it'll, ca it'll, 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 it'll capture some data. And all that will go into your cloud. So to summarize, we have seen in the last few years the digitization of science and medicine. A lot of the knowledge is now available in databases that are free. Now. It was not that long ago that to have that data, you had to work for the pharmaceutical industry because they were the only industry that could afford it. Today, it's free. Or if it's not free, it's so cheap that most scientists can afford it. We talked about a $1,000 genome, actually lower than that now, the microbiome. We have biosensing technology, apps, plug-in devices, smart objects. Smartphones that collect all that data, process it, store it, transmit it. We've got the clouds. We've got patient cohort by the millions. We've got Watson. We've got AI. We've got everything that we need to transform life sciences. It's just a matter of using it. Well, 
we've got everything that we need except perhaps the people who can do that. And those people are you. There's a dire shortage of data scientists developing everywhere in the world. We don't train enough of them, and we don't train them right. We typically, we still train statistician, bioinformatician, engineers, AI specialists, when in fact we ought to be training people who are skilled in all those techniques and have every single one of them in a toolbox. I've been beating on that drum in the US for some time now. Uh, but you know, I was trained originally in Europe. And frankly, I think this is an area where Europe may have an edge over the US. I think the quality of the data, the data scientists that we train in Europe is pretty good. So I think you have an opportunity there to get ahead of the game by getting into the game. It's going to take quite a bit of ingenuity to process the enormous, I mean, here I put terabytes. I mean, it could be petabytes, you know, uh, in a couple of years from now. Uh, that volume of data, I mean, it's great because if you want to run AI, for example, you're going to need, you know, that sort of data. Uh, but it needs, uh, you know, quite a bit of brain power, quite a bit of people in order to do the work. And um, that's where you guys come, in, come into the picture. Not only do we need that to process that data, to understand it, to, uh, to, 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 to extract uh, you know, the, the knowledge that's embedded in it, uh, but we also need to fit it all into a picture that people can understand. Now, one thing that I should have pointed out is that the data that we're collecting from all those biosensors is fundamentally different from the data that we've typically have collected in, in, in clinical research. Clinical trials give you structured data. And we've got lots of people in industry who understand that structured data and know what to do with it. Biosensors give you unstructured data. They monitor the performance of an organ. They tell you what happens. It's quite valuable, but it cannot be used most of the time to test hypotheses. But it's time, it's high frequency and time data. So you can connect, you know, the blood pressure at this time with what happened, you know, to your brain at that other time or to your gut at, that, at, 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 this, at the very same time. And it enables you to see things that, and, 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 and see relationship that uh, perhaps uh, you wouldn't have seen in the past. So this is quite exciting. And Quackenbush is right. Data drives innovation, and the volumes of data that are about to uh, be generated by the industry will have a, a major impact. Major impact in not only helping us understand uh, pathology and biology better, but also in slashing the cost of doing that work. Um, I mentioned earlier, $150 billion a year for 45 drugs doesn't make drugs affordable. Those costs need to be recovered, and it gives you $100,000 pills. That model is unsustainable. Now, the data transformation that we're talking about today has the potential to eliminate 80% easily of, that, of those costs. And, um, if we lower the cost of biomedical innovation, we'll get more innovation, a lot more. And it will be better, and it will be more affordable. Now, there's some challenges along the way. Today, all those data streams don't always end up in the same place. So if it's not in the same place, they can hardly be analyzed as they should be. So we need to work on that. A lot of the time, those data streams come into formats that are incompatible, and that doesn't help. So we need to work on that, and we've got some startups here in, in, in Belgium uh, that have actually cracked that very difficult 
uh, IT problem. The industry needs to develop the capability to analyze unstructured data. It sounds simple, but it is not. And this is where you come in. We need to validate all those biosensors, uh, make sure that they generate data that will be acceptable by the regulators. Uh, obviously, we need to secure and protect the data against uh, misuse, uh, which is a big problem, big challenge. Uh, and we got need to clarify who owns that data and under what condition it can be accessed. Now, this is interesting because historically, you may not know that, the data that is generated from your tissue, from your blood, from, doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the institution that collects it. And try to access it, and you'll see how difficult it is. Now, those organizations that have owned that data so far have been reluctant to share it. And this is unfortunate because data can yield a lot more if it's open than if it's uh, protected. Now, increasingly, we see that situation changing because all those biosensing technologies talked about are under the control of the patients. So increasingly, the data that is being collected is owned and controlled by you and I. And you and I have values that differ from the organization that I've collected data in the past. Patient likes things to be open because intuitively in their guts, they feel that openness breeds innovation. There's no reason to hide it. They like things that are personal. They like things that are, um, they like speed. Uh, they have values that are quite different from the values that have dominated the pharmaceutical industry in the past. And the patients are pushing those value onto the biomedical research enterprise. And in the end, whoever controls data in this industry will control innovation. So you're seeing those changes happening, emerging. And the one thing you can be sure of is that they will happen a lot faster than seems to be possible today. So thank you for your attention. Uh, the impact, we talked about that, you know, more cheaper, more better and cheaper innovation, more patient-friendly and personalized therapies, uh, earlier treatment, more preventive care. You know, I let you see that, read the slide, or finish the, reading the slide. I'd like to now switch to questions uh, and see what sort of a reaction uh, this uh, uh, elicits. Uh, these are just backup slides that I prepared. Um, gives you an idea of the, you know, the, 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 the biomarkers that uh, can be monitored today by those, uh, uh, by those de de um, devices. You know, the vital slide, the vital signs, sleep, emotion, stress, breathing, movement, efforts, EKG, blood glucose, oxygenation, you name it. If you can think of it, some entrepreneurs out there is already making or planning a device in order to measure that. It's amazing. This comes from a, a meeting recently at New York Academy of Sciences where all this was discussed. And uh, I mean, you literally have hundreds of devices that are becoming available to measure all that. So uh, it is big, it is coming fast, it is happening. Uh, the impact on the economics of innovation are momentous. Uh, is going to change many things in our lives. I'd like to stop there and turn it over to you if you have some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernard. I'm going to support you with questions here because we've got this cute little catch box thing. Oh. Yeah. One more round of applause for Bernard Munoz, please. All right. It's okay to clap. It's okay to clap. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I've got the talk box that I can toss out to you. And you can cue him for Bernard. OK, what are you most excited about next through all this research and, and the process of using big data? Well, you know, I, I think changing the world is, uh, is important, is exciting. When I was a student, I wanted to change the world. 
And um, uh, I didn't really know how to do, go about that. Uh, but, you know, so I got my degrees and I started to work and all that. And um, uh, I remember a few years back, uh, I had my reunion, 30 year reunion at Stanford. And um, I talked to my classmates and I discovered that I was one of the few that remained uh, who was really, you know, still out there trying to change stuff. Hmm. Um, so don't underestimate the power that you have to change things. It only takes one brain. It only takes, you know, one good idea to have a momentous impact. I mean, when I started to work on innovation 15 years ago, I, you know, I, I, I realized we spent all that money trying to produce innovation. We don't even understand where it comes from. I mean, this is mismanagement on a grand scale. And I talked to my company, and they looked at me and said, kind of think, who do you think you are, you know, to think that you can change that? And, but, you know, there was this urge that I don't care whether I succeed or not, I'm going to give it a try. I mean, it's, it's so important, and frankly, it's so interesting to me that I'm going to do it. And I was lucky, perhaps, uh, I, but the fact is that I was able to gather data and deconstruct it uh, so that I was indeed able to understand, you know, what, how biomedical innovation is articulated and how to get more of it. And I published that, and those papers have now become um, very well accepted. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's important to want to change things, but it's also important to follow your inner call. Don't bother whether, you know, what the odds are. Just go ahead and do it. And, you know, the capabilities that you have at your fingertips today are so powerful that the ten your, your chances of success are much better than you think. So just go at it. Fantastic. Thank you. And we've got time for one audience question. I'm going to toss this to you. You can speak right into the top of the box. not working. Ah, it is. Ah, okay. yes. Hi, Bernard. Thanks for the talk. Great to hear. So, a question I have is um, what I see uh, harmonizing data and bringing data together, it's not anymore so much about the technology, but uh, about the legal aspects. So, um, I love to, to hear and to see that patients take control over their data and they're going to open it up. But what we see in reality bringing data together is that the legal aspects in getting that sorted out takes months and months while the technology only days. So what's your vision on the patient taking control and the policy makers being ready for us? Yeah, I think uh, uh, lots of organizations start to realize what's happening. Some love it, some do not. You know, Apple, for example, has taken a principal stance that they're not interested in your data. They couldn't care less. They won't even look at it. They're only interested in selling you hardware, which is fine with me. Now, other companies have business model that rely on looking at the data, analyzing it, and reselling it to whoever wants to buy it. You know, two very different approaches. The second one spooks me. The first one kind of promotes confidence, trust. Um, I think the patients are not dumb, and I think they will exercise their muscle to keep control of their data. The science of patient input is something that in the U.S. is gaining extraordinary momentum as we speak. At the beginning of the year, it was not even mentioned in a conversation. You had several publications that appeared in the last couple of months and conferences and all that, it's all over the place. Uh, and is being pushed by very powerful organization. Um, patient will demand that the data be interoperable, end up in the same place. Uh, otherwise, they just won't buy the devices. You know, you want me to buy your hardware? Well, I want that hardware to collect my data and send it to my place in the cloud in a format that I can understand and I can myself access and I will have control of that over that data. And if you're not willing to abide by those conditions, I'll buy somebody else's hardware. 
And I think that patient power is going to be very, well, very powerful. So I, it is a problem today, but I think that problem will resolve itself as people gradually <coughs> start uh, taking stock of how much influence they have over the system. Awesome. Thank you, Bernard. One more time for Bernard Munoz, please.